Greetings and welcome to another video on the 0%, patreon.com forward slash the 0% for all things in regarding to uh, obtaining zero tax liability on state and federal level, asset wealth protection for the next generations and things of such. I wanted to go over a little bit of information today in regards to birth certificate authentication. Some of you have brought to my attention that some of the countries that we have utilized as non-Hague convention countries are no longer non-Hague. They have now been uh, placed under the convention countries list, which are considered Hague countries. So if we go to travel.state.gov, you do a general search in Google, Bing, Yahoo, whichever search engine you like, and you search travel.state.gov or understanding the Hague Convention, Hague Convention countries, key phrases like that, you'll come across this website here. And I want to go over uh, just to get an understanding of what's happening here. So it says the Hague Convention on the protection of children and cooperation in respect to intercountry adoption, AKA convention, is an international agreement to safeguard intercountry adoptions. It was concluded on May 29, 1993 in The Hague, the Netherlands. The convention establishes international standards of practices for intercountry adoptions. The United States signed the convention in 1994, and the convention entered into force for the United States on April 1st, 2008. And you can read the entire text in a PDF format right here. The convention applies to all adoptions by US citizens, habitually resident in the United States of children, habitually resident in any country outside of the United States, that is a party to the convention, AKA convention countries. So I brought to your attention, Minnesota court rules of the judicial branch, rule 220, where it talked about how the United States looks upon any one of us as a minor or someone who is competent to handle their own affairs. And anyone that is considered to be a minor is up for what's called adoptions uh, via their certificate of title, which they utilize as commercial property to barter and trade between countries back and forth. And it's unfortunate that we have people that are in what's called their, their retirement ages, uh, Medicare ages of 65 and, and older, and if they did not do the requirements mentioned in Minnesota Rule 220, as far as the government is concerned, they are under what's called legal disability. They do not have the capacity to handle their foreign affairs, their domestic affairs, their diplomatic affairs. And so the government is going to do that for them. If I go to Minnesota, judicial rule. These are the court rules. Under Title III, under registration of land titles, because that is exactly where the birth certificate sits. It's always sitting with the registrar of the county where you were born in. That's the territory, the land records, and it's in the same department where real estate titles are held and you are considered real property. If you look at the genetic makeup of our bodies here, of dust, of, of water, and many other minerals that's found within the earth. So you are considered what's called um, a fixture. It's just like when you file a UCC in regards to real estate in the county. Most of these counties want it to be done as a fixture filing because they're talking about the minerals and elements real property, which is above the land, and in property real, which is everything below the land, at least 500 feet below. 
you are within that same category. And that is why Minnesota Rule 220 has placed the rules of claiming to be a competent person under your certificate of title, which is the birth certificate, in the same section as land titles. If we click on this, registration of land titles, and we go all the way down to Rule 220. It says that the registrar of titles, that's the registrar in your county, sometimes the recorder clerk, is authorized to receive a registration of memorials. This is affidavits or some type of claim upon any outstanding certificate of title and official birth certificate pertaining to a registered owner named in said certificate of title showing the date of birth of said registered owner. So if your date of birth is on this certificate of title and your name is on it, then you are obviously the one to be said as a registered owner. Now the registered owner has to provide, there is attached to the birth certificate an affidavit of affiant, of an affiant. So you're also going to be the one saying I such and such under declaration of or under penalties of perjury, the United States of America, that I am the said registered owner named in this certificate. I was born on this day. These are my facts of the facts that you are reciting, such as here it was a single baby. You had no twin. This was your weight. This was the time. All of those details are, have to be mentioned in the affidavit. This is your name, right? That you haven't changed your name yet. So even if you have changed your name, if you married, you want to state that as well. Now, that's all the detail that needs to go inside of the affidavit. And guess who gets to record it and accept it? The registrar of titles. So you are going to find your recorder of deeds. Now, this doesn't have to be the county where you were born. It could be any county of record, any county of record, any recorder of deeds. They are an immigration officer within a naturalization court. So if I was born in Los Angeles County and I live in Nebraska or, Je or Missouri in Jefferson County, I can make this statement in Jefferson County and have it recorded with the Jefferson County Recorder of Deeds. And that becomes admissible evidence, a court record that I could utilize now in any court proceeding and dispel the myths right off the back or dispel the games that they play within an ad ad administrative procedures court to where they have complete jurisdiction looking at me as a child someone who is incompetent, where they have to just speak on my behalf or appoint attorneys on my behalf. None of that is constitutional. I have the right to handle my own affairs and here's how I prove it. It's very important that you do this step. When it comes to insurances, this is important. All of this is important. Now, the counties are making money off of these birth certificates. You will find that information in your county's CAFR reports. Every year you have what's called comprehensive annual fiscal responsibility budget reports. They will set budgets, but that does not mean that they are operating within those budgets. They exceed past those budgets. Um, you are considered the cash and that birth certificate certifies as a certificate of deposit, basically. That's how the world works. That is how it all works, how money is circulated within the United States and across the world. It's all based on your labor, your time devoted to your 40 hour work week or whatever you do, and you're gonna pay taxes. So it talked about being outside of the United States. We have a list of countries that are not yet a part of the convention countries, but there are some. For the longest time, 
if we look at the list, these are the countries that you do not want to use when you're authenticating your birth certificate. You do not want to use any of these countries. For the longest time, we were using Thailand. It is now on here. We cannot use Thailand. You can use Taiwan. Guess what else you can use? You can use Morocco. I talked about that in the past where Morocco, this is still under the control of Morocco, under the Sultan, the United States of America. They were the first country to be recognized. Morocco recognized the United States first back in 1777. So do not use any of these countries when you're proceeding to doing your birth certificate authentication. Now, let's go back for a minute. The United States, what is that? Let me go back and read. The convention applies to all adoptions by U.S. citizens habitually resident in the United States of children habitually resident in any country outside the United States that is a party to the convention. Now, I was born in California, the territory of California, the island of Khalifa. That's what it was before it was merged with Nevada and Arizona and Oregon, of course. But I, I am an inhabitant of the territory of Khal Khalifa. I am not a state citizen. I am not a U.S. citizen of the state of California. So obviously, there isn't a process for me to authenticate my birth certificate under the de jure Republic of California because our current Secretary of State is a corporate soul under the de facto federal government. He is not operating under the de jure republic. He is what's called a corporate soul. So that's why we have to utilize a country that is not considered a Hague convention that's not on that list. I can't use my country right now. I cannot use the Republic of California. So I have to go outside of that, outside of it, outside of the de facto democratic. Now, what do I mean when I say that the Secretary of State is a corporate soul. Well, I had to go with that description of what is the United States because we all know under UCC 9307, the location of a debtor, when you go down to section H, section H says the location of the United States is DC. So they're only speaking about DC when they talk about this section here. California is not a part of D.C. Nevada is not a part of D.C. However, because of the session laws, the act of session, California has ceded over their jurisdiction over to D.C. and have become the state of California. So I have to go outside the state of California to authenticate. Let's say I chose Taiwan. That's great. But the California Secretary of State is considered a corporation soul. What is that? A corporation soul is a legal entity consisting of a single soul incorporated office occupied by a single soul natural person. So the legal entity is occupied by a natural person. A natural person is an express trust. That's what we teach. Placing all of your property under the express trust, a natural person that has higher standing over a legal fictitious entity. Let's continue. This structure allows corporations, often religious corporations or commonwealths, governments, to pass without interruption from one office holder to the next, giving positions legal continuity with subsequent office holders having identical powers and possessions to their predecessors. That means that whoever is the corporation soul, there is someone above him. I hope you guys are catching this. A corporation soul is one of two types of corporation. 
the other being a corporation aggregate. Let's go down to where it says ecclesiastical origins. Most corporation souls are church related. For example, the arch, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, although some political offices of the United Kingdom, many times many of the secretaries of states of Canada and the United States are corporation souls. They just said that all secretary of states of the entire North America continent, including Canada, are under the church. They're corporation souls under the church. Now, we're talking about archbishops here. What is the only church in the world that has those titles within their, their church community? That's the Roman Catholic Church. If you go down, it says the concept of corporation soul originated as a means for orderly transfers of ecclesiastical property, serving to keep the title within the denomination or religious society. You have a religious title if you have a birth certificate and the name is registered under the Secretary of State. It says the state of California, the state of Nevada. The secretary works for that. That is a title. That, that's why they do these birth certificates. To place you as their property, ecclesiastical property, in their express trust to have this right of receiving annual dues in the form of taxes on the state level and the federal level. If you have an LLC, you, are, you have been given a religious title. And that is under the corporation soul, your secretary of state. You go to the secretary of state to get permission to earn $1 of operating business, whatever that business is in your state. If you have an S or C corporation, you go to the corporation soul to get permission to earn $1, whatever that business is in your state. The corporation soul takes that dollar and transfers it to who? A trust under the Roman Catholic Church. That's what this is all about. Everything is under the triune city empire. If you were to look at, let's see if I can share this here. If you were to look at, um, let me see if I can stop my share for a second. There we go. Look at the Washington DC birth certificate. On the birth certificate, it has Washington, D.C. seal, their flag. You see three stars. That is what I mean by the triune empire, tri-city empire. The first is D.C. The second is London. That's the financial power. D.C. is the military power. And the last one is the Vatican. That's the religious power power that controls the world. These three entities control the entire world. So if you want to get away from this and not be considered a child under the international inter-country adoptions, you have to follow the rules of Minnesota Rule 220. Now you know this. Most people know this now who are members of the Patreon community. You do not need to utilize Thailand anymore. Uh, this was last updated September 8, 2021. However, if you have received a fully authenticated birth certificate, even by using Thailand, you are good. Because if it wasn't a part of the Hague Convention, they would never issue a authentication certificate for you. But I do not want you to waste time. I do not want you to lose time in your filing. So let's not use Thailand anymore. Let's go with Taiwan. Let's go with Morocco. Until then, um, until we find you know, additional information that those two countries have been added as a Hague Convention country, we will use those. Now, I wanna go to public law. 108 458. Let me change my share here.
Public Law 108-458. Go down. Right here, we're going to talk about the minimum standards for birth certificates. Let's read A. The definition in this section, enacting this note and repealing provisions set out as a note below, the term birth certificate means a certificate of birth. In London, they don't call this B-I-R-T-H. It is B-E-R-T-H, birth as in cargo delivery from a ship on the water. That's the connection to maritime admiralty law. Number one, birth certificate means for an individual, regardless of where born, A, who is a citizen or national of the United States at birth, and B, I mean, A does not apply to us, B, whose birth is registered in the United States. It is. That's why we can never change the makeup of what that entity is on the birth certificate. You can never change it. This is why we give it to the trust and we control it. We take it out of their hands and we utilize it for our benefit, for our wealth preservation. Because your inheritance is in there. It's in the, the uncertificated security, which is the social, and it's in the certificated security, which is the birth certificate. They're using it. But until you do a process like this, your trust uses it. Number two, A, is issued by a federal, state, or local government agency. This is city or county or township or authorized custodian of record and produced from birth records maintained by such agency or custodian of record. Or B, is an authenticated copy issued by a federal, state, or local government agency or authorized custodian of record, which is vital statistics, of an original certificate of birth issued by such agency or custodian of record. This is why you're going to do it, an authenticated copy. It makes it on par as the original that was issued by them. You see, they're not going to give you the original. Even if you have an authenticated copy, that it's not going to surrender the original because they don't know your plans. They don't know if you decide to do this for a short amount of time and just say, well, I'm not going to exercise this anymore. Well, they're going to use it if that's the point. So you have to always prove your jurisdiction. Always prove your standing in law and where you are when it comes to your estate affairs. The original birth certificate has, or the original live birth, it has a copy of your, your baby footprint and a, a blood stamp from the sole of your foot. That's why they call it the corporation soul when it comes to you. They take the blood from your baby foot, and stamp it on the live birth certificate with a footprint. It, it seems to be almost ritualistic what they do. And there is a lot of magic involved in that. M-A-I-G-I-C-K. However, it is what it is. We couldn't stop it. We were born. Our parents didn't know what they were doing. So I want you to understand something. If we go down to, I'm going to talk about the grants, the grants that the states utilize when it comes to birth certificates. If we look at number five here, it says the extension. Uh, no, let's go back up right here. Section three, minimum standards. Not later than one year after the date of enactment of this act, which is December 17, 2004, the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall, by regulation, establish minimum standards for birth certificates for use by federal agencies for official purposes that at a minimum shall require certification of the birth certificate by the state or local government custodian of record 
that issue the certificate and shall require the use of safety paper. This is bank note paper. Security features that you may find on checks and currency that we circulate. Or an alternative equally secure medium, the seal of the issuing custodian of record and other features designated or designed to prevent tampering, counterfeiting, or otherwise duplicating the birth certificate for fraudulent purposes. Let's go down. Now they mentioned who, which department? The Secretary of Health and Human Services. If you recall in another video that we went over, we just dis discovered that this department is created by who? The executive branch. Let's go down. Grants to the states. In general, beginning on the date a final regulation is promulgated under subsection B3, the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall award grants to states to assist them in conforming to the minimum standards for birth certificates set forth in the regulation. Did you guys catch that? The executive department issued grants to the states, the legislative branch of government, House, House of Representatives, and the Senate. This is a violation of the Constitution. The clause talking about separation of powers, each branch has separate powers, and generally each branch is not allowed to exercise the powers of the other branches. They are benefiting federal and state, they are benefiting from the checks and balances that's not taking place because we're not calling them out on it, but they're benefiting from the money that's being generated, uh, hypothecation on those certificates of birth, those CDs. It's a major lawsuit if you can call them out on it. I wouldn't call them out on it individually it would take an actual group of people, an actual group of express trust coming together to form a confederation and to close this out. That's how you would have to do it. Now, the Secretary of Health and Human Services comes from the federal executive departments that's authorized by the Administrative Procedures Act of 1946. If you were to click on to see what some of those departments are, all of these Apartments are who? Uh, departments are DC, the state, the Department of State who issues passports. That's a conflict of interest. You shouldn't have to have to obtain a passport to lead the country. Articles of Confederation says you have the right to ingress and regress to and from. That's a natural inhabitant right. And yet they're giving you what's called a title of nobility so that you can leave. They're giving you a driver's license. That's a title of nobility. They're giving you a passport. That's a title of nobility. They're giving you a legal permanent resident card. That's a title of nobility. Where the Constitution, the U.S. government Constitution and the state says that no title of nobility shall be issued by the state. And yet they're doing it and no one is calling them out on it. Individually, you may fail at that. But as a group, the whole number of the people coming together and actually realizing that they are the beneficiaries and these people here are the trustees, then you make a change. But you have to do this process. So here it is. Health and Human Services. They are a part of the executive government. And so the whole point of this Administrative Procedures Act, bringing this up, it serves as a sort of constitution. It's not the constitution, but it's act, excuse me, it's acting like it. This is a fake jurisdiction where they have everyone in court. You've never actually been in a real court proceeding. You've always been under the abuse and neglect court system that's authorized by the APA. It's a sort of constitution, trial-like procedures. No just, no real court. 
is happening. And most people understand that the real court is the common law court, but no one knows how to activate it. It's there. It's there. The court that you're in, which is an administrative procedures uh, proceeding, you're in it. You just have to activate it. There's certain ways to do that with your paperwork and by what you say. And then you'll find yourself in a common law court where the Constitution can now come in and give you a fair trial. Separation of powers is where they have it. Every secretary of state is what's called a corporation sole under the Vatican. They're taking your property under ecclesiastical um, ecclesiastical rights, the laws of ecclesiastical rights. You have the power to stop that. This is why when you have an LOC or corporation, I tell you guys to do your articles over and make the express trust a natural person, the owner, the sole member of that LOC or corporation. And then you list yourself as a manager. You work on behalf of the express trust. You owe permanent allegiance to the express trust. And when they see that, they have to treat you the same way the secretary of state is being treated by the one above him. Monkey see, monkey do. Okay. Now, when you do your birth certificates going forward for all new people coming in to do this, this is the list that you want to stay away from. You do not want to use these countries. I say always come to this website here, travel.state.gov, to get an up to date up to date version of that. Here you can click this icon, which will allow you to download an Excel spreadsheet of this. And then you compare it with all the other countries in the world that are not on this list. And that will be the country that you use to authenticate your birth certificate. As I said before, look at your birth certificate. Look at it. If it looks anything like this, uh, you go directly to the Secretary of State, find their forms online, and begin the process. When that comes back, you go up, move on to the Department of State and finalize it there. But if you have anything on your birth certificate that shows, it doesn't say the state of California, it doesn't say your state, it just says uh, a public health officer. If the certificate was issued by a public health officer, usually a physician, then you need to go directly to the county where that public health officer has sworn in and you need to obtain what's called certificate of exemplification. Exemplification is the first step for you. Then you can move forward to the state and then the U.S. Department of State, all right? So you probably didn't see what I was showing you there, let me go back to it just in case. Back to this birth certificate. See here it says the Department of Health. And, but it does say the D District of Columbia. Some birth certificates, it doesn't say the state of Nevada, it doesn't say the state of Oregon, Wyoming, it doesn't say any of that. It just says public health officer issued by the county. If yours is that way, go to the county and do it. a process of exemplification first then you go to the Secretary of State, and then you go to the U.S. Department of State. Okay, so with that being said, that's going to be it. Um, if you have any questions, please leave comments down below. As always, go to patreon.com to get the full course on how to complete this from beginning to end. Uh, you will find that this may take a while to complete because of certain offices or municipal agencies like to stall out the practices. They do understand what we're doing. They know they can't stop what we're doing, but they can stall what we're doing. And we're finding that a lot with people in many different jurisdictions. However, you will finish. You will get to the level where you have zero tax liability on every level of government. I don't care if you're an employee or if you're self-employed or you have your own business. It does not matter. You will obtain that. And as you have seen, as you have seen, that this here, the list of countries, 
it is growing. They are slowly adding a lot of countries into the Hague Convention. And when that happens, when it's all done, they are going to shut down the ability of, of you calling the IRS at that specific number, the international hotline, to obtain your tax exempt number for the trust. There will be a day where they shut that down. I don't know when that will be, but there will be a day when they shut that down. And if that is the case, and you don't have your information, you don't have your, your packet put together to defend your property, you will have to undergo someone else's trust. You have to seek an asylum under their trust. Hopefully you know someone. So don't let that be you. Get this done. It is your responsibility. With that being said, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.